I've been working with Unity for more than four years since I joined my first game jam. I felt like it was time that I tangibly showed myself just how much I have improved as a game developer. To do this, I finally joined my second game jam. In this video, I'm going to talk about my journey, look at how easy it was for me to misjudge scope, and share some advice that ultimately saved my game and might just save yours. In 2018, after only a couple of months of learning Unity, I participated in my first game jam. It was the Blackthorn Prod Game Jam No. 1, hosted by fellow YouTuber Noah Callis. Despite my limited knowledge, I created a game that, while very basic and not all that fun looking at it now, I was really proud of. I learned a lot while making it, and I always wanted to join more jams so I could track my progress. However, due to being extremely busy with my degree, I was unable to do so. Four years passed so quickly, and I decided it was time. Time for me to test exactly how much I had improved. Despite still being very busy, I saw the Ukraine Winter Game Jam as the perfect opportunity to participate in a month-long event where I could work on a project for an hour to a day instead of rushing and trying to finish everything in 72 hours. Quick spoiler, I spent a lot more than one or two hours a day for the last month. This jam consumed my entire life and every single second of free time I had, but I loved it. The theme was released on January 27th at 2 a.m. while I was anxiously asleep. I had a whole month after all. When I woke up, I saw the theme, living and fighting in the cold and dark. I was extremely pleased with this theme. While keeping in mind that I only wanted to take it chill, I immediately began brainstorming ideas I had as I got ready for the day. Eventually, I sat down and carved my main idea into Obsidian. My plan was to create a slow-paced, top-down survival looter shooter with the atmosphere of a metro game, the inventory complexity of Escape from Tarkov, and elements of the 7 Days to Die game loop. The game would involve looting and collecting resources during the day, and then using those resources to create items that would help the players stay warm at night while fending off hordes of zombies in the dark. I wrote all this down knowing that I only wanted to spend an hour or two a day on this game and said, yep, I can do that, no problem. Anyone with some experience would know that it's impossible to accomplish all that in a month, let alone working only a few hours a day. As a result, I had to reluctantly and gradually scale back my game's scope over the course of the entire month. So instead of showing you all the big ideas I had and how I had to compromise, let's just focus on what I ended up actually creating, and at the end of the video I'll share my friend's advice that helped me create the best possible game despite my overly ambitious scope. So here's the final game concept. In a world devastated by nuclear war, the lands have been ravaged by nuclear winter. Those who were not killed by the initial blasts were mutated by the radiation, turning them into mindless zombies. One survivor travels north in search of Sanctuary, a rumored safe haven for other survivors. However, his journey is interrupted when his car breaks down on a long, quiet road. Now he must defend himself against endless hordes of the undead, while attempting to repair his car so he can continue his journey. The gameplay is a simple yet punchy top-down shooter, featuring various weapons and enemy types. The player can carry up to three weapons at a time, and these weapons are randomly dropped by slain enemies. Each weapon uses one of four specific ammo types, which are also dropped by these enemies. The goal of the game is to collect four different car parts necessary to repair the vehicle and win the game, or you can just see how long you can survive. Additionally, the game features a day-night cycle where the player must rely on their flashlight to spot their enemies at night. The day-night cycle was a crucial thematic aspect of my game, so I began by creating a new Unity URP project and experimenting with 2D lights to see if I could achieve the effect that I wanted. I envisioned zombies casting long shadows, and I wanted the transition from day and night to be seamless without flashlights appearing too bright or too dim. After messing around with the different lights and adjusting their intensity values, I finally achieved a look that I was pleased with. Confident that the lights could meet my needs, I moved on to developing the character controller. I started by creating a simple white square for the player. I then implemented WASD movement and rotated the player in the direction of movement. 
It wasn't long before I replaced the white square with a smaller brown square for the head and a bluish green rectangle for the shoulders. I also added some arms just to make sure the player was actually rotating the way I wanted. And after some final tweaks, I got it working just right. Initially, the player would rotate towards the direction of movement and only face the cursor when the player was aiming down sights. In the final version, the player would always face towards the mouse. After this, I added a simple black rectangle to represent a gun and started working on the weapon system. Working with audio was something I still had almost no experience with, so I decided I needed to get audio in as soon as possible, that way I wouldn't have a nightmare of a time trying to get it all in last minute. So that meant I got to listen to this sound quite a lot. Good thing the sound asset I bought was very satisfying. At this point, I started working on bullets. Bullets are a simple game object that uses a raycast to detect what it hits. The bullet graphics come from a trail renderer and would draw a shrinking tail along the path that it was traveling. I only ran into a couple of issues here. The first issue that popped up was the bullet fountain I created when I forgot to turn off gravity. The second main issue was the trail would not always render to the object that was hit. I solved this by making sure that after hitting something, the impact point would be the final point added to the trail path, and that the bullet would wait for the trail lifetime before being returned to its object pool. That way the trail would always draw to the object that was hit and would fade away naturally. I am very happy with the look of the bullets, and other than implementing damage later on, I did not really have to change anything about it for the rest of the project. So with the ability to now fire bullets, I started working on the weapon recoil system. I wanted recoil to be an essential part of the gunplay. I wanted to feel the power behind the weapons, and for aiming down sights in a top-down shooter to actually mean something. In this case, it means better recoil resistance and recovery at the cost of movement speed. The first step to creating the recoil system was weapon spread. When fired, projectiles would travel somewhere within a random cone determined by the spread angle. To indicate what the current weapon spread is wherever the mouse is, I used the shapes package by Freya Homer to create a circle with the perfect radius to fit inside this spread cone. The next step was to change the weapon spread based on the player's current state. So as the player changed from idle to move to run to ADS, the base spread angle of the weapon would be different. Obviously, it would be a lot less accurate trying to shoot while sprinting versus standing still and actually aiming the weapon. So after that, it was time to make the current spread angle increase by some amount whenever the weapon was fired and then slowly decay it back down to its base value. The final product of the weapon recoil system allowed me to define specific weapon recoil states. A recoil state consists of a base spread angle, an increase state, and two decay rates. One decay rate is used in the case where the player is tap firing. The goal here was to make weapons extremely accurate while tap firing. The other decay rate is used in the case where the player is holding down the trigger of a fully automatic weapon. So it'll decay a lot slower, meaning the weapon will become less accurate the longer you are spraying. After getting tired of testing my weapons on simple red targets that did nothing, I created a super simple zombie enemy that would just move towards the player. I also created a spawner that would spawn a new zombie every second. This really started bringing the game to life. As you've probably noticed in the past clips, the character graphics have changed quite a lot. Every now and then I would play around with how the character was set up so that I could experiment and find a look and style that worked for me. Initially, I wanted to create a bunch of custom art, but then I decided that I had neither the time nor the ability to create any artwork that was in my head and that would look good for this game. So programmer art it was. I decided I was going to do as much as possible using just simple primitives. Not only would this slash away at the amount of work that I had to do, but it creates great stylistic consistency. So I experimented with using two rectangles per arm and rotating and stretching them to make the character look more natural holding the weapon. I somehow created this, which obviously does not look very natural at all, but you'll see later on the final results, in my opinion, were very good. I then created a custom inverse kinematics implementation for the arms. When I finally got it working just right, it allowed me to define where the hands should sit on the weapon. That way I could animate the weapon for different player states and the arms would always be in the right position. The reason this had to be a custom implementation was that I wanted the pull of the arm, or the elbow in this case, to cause the arm segments to grow and shrink. That way I could give the illusion of depth 
in my weapon animations. During this time I also started experimenting with adding melee weapons to the game as a way for the player to defend themselves if they had run out of ammo or as a way to collect wood from trees for fire. I never got this far with the game and thankfully I did not spend too much time on it. After this I gave the player legs with the magic of sine waves. Legs are simply different game objects representing various joints and I then used a sine wave to offset the joints with various amplitudes and phases. Finally I just stretch out some primitives between the joints to create the actual leg graphics. I also added a hip joint that could only rotate so far from the player's facing direction. In my opinion, looking at the movement from above like this, it feels very natural and almost how you might realistically turn your hips and move your legs if you're walking sideways or backwards or something like that. So yeah, sine waves are pretty awesome. With the weapons and movement implemented, I spent some time creating the UI that shows the current weapons the player has equipped, the ammo that they use, and how much ammo the player has, and just general other information like that. I also created weapon and ammo pickups. During this time, I also finally implemented Weapon Reload. It was a bit of a struggle figuring out how to implement various types of reload, as I had weapons like the Assault Rifle that used a magazine, and weapons like the Pump Shotgun where you fed in one round at a time. I came up with something akin to the strategy pattern, where I could inject the reload method when I created a weapon. So in the weapon data, I could assign a reload method, where the reload method was simply a scriptable object pointing at a class from which to create the correct object that would handle reload for this particular weapon. I really love this approach as it gave me a lot of flexibility for weapon reload. For example, allowing sequential reload like the shotgun to be interrupted. Next, I finally started messing around with the day-night system. Again, sine waves came to the rescue. Using the sine wave, I could adjust the color and intensity of the global light, making it white during the day and a dark bluish purple at night. To get the flashlights to work nicely, I limit its intensity to always being 1 minus the global light intensity. That way the area lit up by the flashlights always had a consistent value. I also made it so that the flashlights would only turn on once the daylight intensity got below a certain value. I really liked the look of enemies causing shadows from the muzzle flash and flashlight. Unfortunately, it caused my computer to do this. So instead of spending too much time trying to figure out how to optimize it, I decided to just turn off shadows. The lighting still looked really great in my opinion and really fit the rest of the game's aesthetic. Next I created player health. Enemies simply damage the player when they make contact with its collider, and the damage is on a simple cooldown. If the player dies, the game is over. I also later created health packs that would spawn randomly around the player that it could use to just regain some health. After this, I created a super simple quest system that required the player to collect and bring car parts back to the car. So a part would randomly spawn when the game starts, and you'd get an arrow pointing you towards that part. Once you collect that part and bring it back to the car, it would spawn the next one. Once you collected all the parts, you would win the game. When the quest system was done, I implemented stamina, and only allowed the player to run while the stamina bar was not empty. Once the player stopped running, stamina would only start to recharge after a couple of seconds. Getting close to the end of the project now, I created many different weapons. The way I set up the system made it really easy to contain all the relevant weapon data in a single scriptable object, including the prefab for how the weapon looked in the player's hand, the image used for the UI, and things like that. This combined with different recoil stage, damage amounts, and penetration made it very simple to create a wide variety of weapons that all felt unique. The final challenge was to create fun and engaging enemies. At this point I had already created that super simple test zombie and as I did not have much time left, I tried to stretch what I had already created as far as possible. So instead of creating super custom zombie implementations, I simply created copies of the basic zombie, adjusted their art, and gave each variation different stats. For example, the smaller zombie would have little health, do little damage, but move very quickly. The bigger zombies would have lots of health, do lots of damage, but move very slowly. The next step to making the enemies fun and engaging was the wave system. I could not introduce all the different types of enemies at the start of the game, so instead I created a system where a new wave would start every minute. For each wave I could assign an enemy probability table. This probability table defined which enemies it could spawn this round and how common each variation would be. 
This allowed me to really adjust the pacing and feel of the game. I also created loot tables for the weapons and ammo drops that would happen when you kill an enemy. So with that, the game was basically complete. All I had to do was make sure my menu system looked good, my settings page worked, add some music and different sounds, and ensure that I put all the credits where credits were due. And with that, after a lot more balancing and some last minute feedback and bug fixes, my second ever game jam came to an end. I am very, very happy with how this project turned out. I'll put a link in the description where you can find the game, and if you want, please give me some feedback. I would love to know what you thought, and if you think I should keep working on this project. All in all, I'm super pleased with the result. It was once again thanks to the advice that my friend gave me at the very beginning that helped me end up with something awesome. When I first ran my clearly impossible ideas past him, without shooting any of them down, he said, just start by focusing on the main mechanic and make sure it feels exactly or as close to the way you want it to before you move on to any of the others. People are going to play your game to shoot zombies, not to organize their inventory. I'm sure this is not advice you've never heard before. There is a reason we start by prototyping our game instead of jumping into everything all at once. But sometimes we just need to be reminded of it. And well, that is what I did. By staying focused on the gunplay and shooting zombies and making sure it felt right, it helped me realize throughout the entire process just how ambitious my initial concepts were. Had I tried to focus a little bit on everything all over the place, I would have ended up with something very half-baked at best. But following this advice also helped me follow the fun of my game as I was developing it. And ultimately, I feel that it led to the best possible thing I could have created in this time. Comparing this jam to my first jam is really not fair as I spent magnitudes more time on this one than the last one. However, I can confidently say that even given a year back then, I could not have created anything like this. So yes, I have improved as a game developer. So I guess I'll see you for jam number three in four more years. Before I go, I would just like to say thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. A huge special thank you to Cody Lee, SM, Major Sims, Jake Skarupa, Patrick, Atami, Mike Rodriguez, and Nathan Ackley. You guys are absolute mad lads, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.